Hello and welcome to Never Mind the Dam Busters, the RAF Bomber Command podcast with me, James Jeffries, and Jane Gifford Lode. Uh, we'll be talking today in our first episode about the background to RAF Bomber Command, why it came about, what it was, and yeah, what it did. So, uh, Jane, tell us a little bit more about well, why we decided to uh, do this pod. Hi, everyone. So we decided to start this podcast to take a deep dive into the history of RAF Bomber Command. It's such a huge topic, and we felt that other podcasts, YouTube shows, etc., have touched on various aspects of what the work of Bomber Command and its history, but there's been nothing which solely focuses on this really important part of what the RAF did during the Second World War. So we decided to address that, and here we are. So uh, I'm going to talk about my interest in Bomber Command, where it came from. Uh, apologies for those that have heard this story before, but I'm going to talk about my general interest in history. It started when I was a boy and I watched the film Battle of Britain uh, from the 1960s and I fell in love with the Spitfire. I fell in love with Fighter Command. I wanted to be a Spitfire pilot, but I had questions and the big ones really were what happened before and what happened afterwards. And that grew from that film into watching other war films. So it went down the longest day. I watched Dunkirk. I watched the Dam Busters. And when I discovered about RAF Bomber Command, almost like what happened next, it felt like uh, that was the way that it sort of led up. I was absolutely fascinated. And knowing that it was more than just uh, the Dam Busters, led to a fascination with the memory of Bomber Command and the fact that it is a, a topic of, of deep discussion and the fact that there hasn't, well, there wasn't a national memorial for so long. And there is the the discussions over the policies and such like. I was absolutely fascinated. And that led eventually to me uh, leading to my MA dissertation, which is looking at Bomber Command and shout out very quickly to Coastal Command, uh, their roles in the Battle of Britain because it very much wasn't about Spitfires and Hurricanes and such like. And when I found out about Two Group and the Bristol Blenheims, more later folks, I was absolutely hooked and realised there were so many stories that hadn't been told. And just how many people had been touched by RF on command. I think in many ways, it, it, it's a possibly Britain's war. It, it, it's from start to finish. The gargantuan amount of materials and tech and everything that went into it is, well, it speaks for itself. Um, and I was hooked. And that's really where it, it, it come from. And I'm still learning everything. The more I realize I dive into it, the more I realize I don't know, I don't understand. Uh, and and it, it just it just grabs you and you just constantly want to know more. Um, and now I'm going to ask the same story to Jane. Uh, where does your interest in Bummer Command come from? I come to Bomber Command from a slightly different background, and that is that I pretty much grew up with RAF Bomber Command in the background. Um, my grandparents' generation fought in the Second World War, and my great uncle Jack was a wireless operator with 10 Squadron RAF Bomber Command. And another great uncle, my uncle Leo, on the other side of the family, was ground crew for the same squadron at the same time. So they knew each other very well and sort of operated together as a team, if you like. From being a child, Bomber Command was something which was talked about a lot in my family. And one of my earlier memories is sitting watching the Dam Busters with my grandparents and my grandmother explaining the role of the wireless operator. But this is what your Uncle Jack did while we watched it. So it's something which had always been there. And as I grew older and became more interested in history and more obsessed with the Second World War, again, thanks, grandparents, and it was just something that I really, really wanted to explore further. Eventually, I ended up uh, writing a book about uh, Jack and Leo's experiences in the Second World War and about 10 Squadron. And it was after writing that book that I realised that there was so much more that I needed to know. That led to me pursuing a master's degree at the University of Wolverhampton in Second World War Studies. And it's just gone on from there, really. My uh, thesis was on the subject of Bomber Command's mine laying operations, which again, more of that later. We'll have a whole episode on that, no doubt. So, yeah, it's just a, a topic which I find endlessly fascinating. And it is so enormous. I don't think there's anyone out there mm. who can sort of pretend to know everything that there is about RAF Bomber Command. It's impossible. 
So what are you working on at the moment then, James? So at the moment, I'm looking at memoirs. So I've come across two that have been very interesting. Uh, I recently read Ron Smith's Rear Gunner Pathfinders, which has got some incredibly written moments. So I I think I recently shared on Twitter um, X this description of when he and his crew walk into this hut and the previous crew's stuff haven't been collected haven't been collected so he goes to this bed and it's still unmade and there's a picture of a girl on the side and a box with things in and yeah it's just the wonder of okay well who were they how many missions have they done who was that girl what what, what's happening what were the family and it's yeah the the whole narrative is just incredibly powerful and um yeah the other one i've recently read technically isn't a memoir it's by Gerald Sherwood, who was the son of John Sherwood, who flew with 97 Squadron, um, who flew in the Augsburg Raid, which is a a topic very close to my heart, something I find very, very fascinating, very unique. And basically, it, it talks about Sherwood volunteering. So he was a pre-war pilot. He then flew with 207 Squadron, and it talks very much about the adaptation from the Avro Manchester to the Avro Lancaster, but then the Augsburg raid, Sherwood, spoiler folks, if you don't know the story, uh, his aircraft was shot down. All of his crew were killed. He was flown out of the cockpit, landed in a woods and was found by um, a civilian that was walking his dog at the time. He was in hospital with minor burns and he was eventually sent to Stalag Wolf, uh, Stalag Wolf, Stalag Luft 3, where the great escape happened and also where Masters of the Air is set when they're in the POW camp for a large portion. And it, it, it's a really, really engaging, brilliant read. And there was so much about John. I didn't realize I knew that I'm pursuing and uh, going down. I've also spoken to John's grandson about this. Um, and it's just an absolutely incredible story. As well as this, I've also been looking at the Luftwaffe. Oh, I've also, um, I know, <laughs> looking at the other side, but I think it's important. You. Under, uh, you know, you know, you've got to look at what the defences were, what the attitude was. Absolutely. So I've been looking at the development. Yeah, of, of course, of course. Um, I've been looking at the development of the uh, BF-109. So I've been really fascinated by, and this is something I think that is very prevalent with the bombing war, and especially with RF Bomber Command, is the technology battle. It feels like everyone goes slightly ahead at some point. The Germans have got this tech. Oh, no, the British have to countermand it with this tech. And then it's just this constant leapfrogging. It's like a cat and mouse race, isn't it, all the time? It it really, just learning the ins and outs of the development and how it was used as a means of defence when it came to defending uh, the Reich and such like. But that's, not, that's pretty much what I've been looking at. So quite a lot, I have to say. You've certainly got your hands <laughs> full there, haven't holes you? Out yeah, of that as well. Absolutely. That sounds like about <laughs> yes, 10 yes. years worth of work there. And there's, I've got a whole pile, as we all have, I'm sure, a whole pile of books I need to get for, including numerous uh, memoirs and such like. But Jane, what have you been uh, looking at? Right. Well, I've been finishing off, finally, my book on Bomber Command's mine laying campaign which ran from 1940 right up to 1945. This was the subject of my master's thesis as I touched on earlier Um, and I really wanted to get to grips with what mine laying was, why it was important to the war effort as a whole and why in particular it's not being talked about at all by any sort of or even naval historians in the, sort of in the, in the last 80 years, really, it's been pretty much ignored. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to look at it in particular. But it's, yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating. I've really, really enjoyed writing this book. At the moment, it's just about finished. I've just got the final tweaks to do. Just waiting for the maps and the charts and the diagrams and all the exciting stuff like that. And then we're ready to go. So hopefully it will be out towards uh, the end of the year. But I also wanted to look at it from the, not just from the RES point of view, but from the the sort of sharp end of the campaign, if you like. So I'm examining what it's like to be on board a German merchant ship that's sort of having to travel through mine-infested waters, what it's like on a German mine sweep, all that sort of thing as well. I think it's always really important to get both sides of the story. So hopefully it'll be be quite an exciting narrative when when it's all complete. That should hopefully be out at the end of the year. Anyway, let's get down to business and what we're going to be talking about in the first episode. And that is 
what were the origins of Bomber Command and why was it needed? Do you want to give us a start on that, James? Yeah, I mean, this is massive. This is a huge thing really to discuss. And really, one of the main reasons we get the Royal Air Force, the first independent air force, is because there's a need for a strategic bomber force. Now, for those who might not know what I mean by that, a strategic bomber force, you've got this technology that is the peak of modernity when it comes to warfare. It can drop bombs hundreds of miles behind enemy lines. It can disrupt communication lines. It can bomb factories. And the idea is, if you can use this, you could just stop an army from moving. You could stop a country from functioning. You could cause riots, perhaps even a revolution out of it, um, because the whole infrastructure is disrupted. And this is the theory that comes into the idea of, the, of, the, of forming the Royal Air Force is, let's have this strategic bombing force. And in the interwar years, you have people like um, Douay and, and Trenchard. And there are many others uh, in America, you, you, you've got it as well with, with Mitchell and, and, and such like, saying perhaps you don't even need troops on the ground. The next war could be incredibly quick. It could just be a massive horde of bombers that are coming through, absolutely wreaking havoc, and countries just surrender. It's the flip side of that. Yeah, this is one of the things which comes Sorry. out of the First World War, isn't it? Which is this idea that yeah. if you've got a strategic bombing air force, you could perhaps avoid the need for ground warfare altogether so that four years of Absolutely. attrition, you know, and this yeah. sort of deadlock of the First World War land battles mm. is something which could potentially be completely avoided. That could be old news, if you like. Yeah. This is really prevalent in their minds. So they're thinking of the first day of the Somme, they're thinking of passion and going, we can't possibly have that. We can't have regiments absolutely mowed down by machine gun fire. Okay, a few bombers are lost. Um, in, in terms of lives lost, that's going to be a lot less. There's also, on the flip side of that, the idea that actually this could act as a deterrent. If nations have these huge bomber forces, they don't want to use them. It's almost the beginning of the mutually assured destruction that you get in, in, in uh, after the war, after 1945, with the nuclear weapons. It's this sense of, well, if we've got these huge bomber forces, in, in each of the major countries, they're not going to want to attack. And this really is sort of, well, Britain wants to, to, to match up to this. It is an island. It's got a chance to, to use this force. It's got a, it's got a navy. But the, the, the other progression from that is to have this huge independent air force and especially a bomber force. I think there's something very important as well, which comes out of these air power theorists of the, the, 19, the 1920s and 30s. And that is... Mm. The concept of, of total war, if you like, and Douay in particular, yeah. in his theory, there was to be no distinction between combat combatants and civilians. So you mm -hmm. have entire nation states confronting each other, and that means that civilian populations now become legitimate targets, which of course is exactly what happened in the Second World War, and particularly yeah. during the strategic bombing campaign. So it's envisaged that you would have large formations of heavy bombers carrying out attacks on enemy centres of population and industry. And again, mm -hmm. that's pretty much what we ended up with in the Second World War. But the key to this, isn't it, is targeting morale, which ultimately, as we now know, means bombing civilians. But I think it's something which is perhaps being, being missed, and that's that this is all very well and good, but your enemy is going to be trying to do exactly the same thing. So ideally, you want to be able to exactly. destroy his air force on the ground so that he can't come and do the same same to you. Ab absolutely. And, th and that is the, the, the idea. And, and you've got Stanley Baldwin. This is often said the bomber will always get through. In, in part, I think it's 1932, I think. It's quite early, um, isn't it? I, I can't think. remember yeah. exactly when. It is early on. And this is, of course, played out to a certain degree, especially in the media. So you have the film uh, Things to Come, H.G. Mm. Wells, and you have the image of London being bombed and brought to an absolute standstill. And then at the same time, the other side of the world, you have bombing in China. You have Abyssinia, now Ethiopia, being bombed, gas being dropped. There's a huge fear over gas. This is why gas masks are distributed. Because there's a fear of actually, yeah, not only bombs, but dropping gas and the calculations as well for the number of figures of dead, dead and wounded is absolutely sky high. So when it comes oh, to the Munich crisis. It was going to be millions, crisis, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was going to be millions. 
and and to say that they were trying to understand people fleeing and in, in the roads and this absolute chaos there is a massive fear of the bomber probably and the, also the other thing that's happening which i know we're going to talk about in a minute is the development of the bomber is pretty frightening as well over the especially in the 1930s just how much bigger they're getting how the, how the bomb loads are getting bigger the distance they're able to cover it's scary it's very very scary so how does that actually translate then into events on the ground how does all of this air power theory actually translate into reality first we have the sort of restructuring of the RAF in, in 1936 don't we into the different commands you want to explain a little bit more about that yeah really it, it's a modernization of the royal air force so you have things like fighter command which self-explanatory is going to be the fighter aircraft you have the integrated defense system that's linked to that the delving system as it's known with radar detecting the enemy bombers um you then have bomber command which is going to be the attacking force you have coastal command that are going to support the navy and patrolling the coast and such like then you also have things like balloon command as well um, that was a new one on me the... yeah i've never heard of that one that was, yeah, which self-explanatory. It, it, it's not people just blowing up balloons for parties. It is them having these huge barrage balloons over cities that stop bombers because they've got these huge steel cables that are extremely high that stop bombers from flying low, meaning the accuracy is not going to be so good. And hopefully, you can take a few down. You have your AKAT guns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so there is the, this this rebranding and this restructuring of the defence system in, in thirty six onwards. I wish there were a number of individuals that play a, a key part in this, and it's the modernising of the air force as well. So you have a new wave of modern aircraft, fighter and bomber as well. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. What is the shape of the RAF and bomber command in particular? by the end of the 1930s. So by 1939, when war breaks mm. out, what does Bomber Command actually look like at that point in time? There's a lot of learning going on. And the thing is, it's it's the pace of development that is quite really de- incredible. So you have aircraft like the Handy Page Hayford, which was actually in service until 1941. And you look at it and it's this biplane twin engine bomber that looks so out of place in the late 30s. It looks like it's out of the First World War. Um, you also have aircraft light bombers like the Hawker Hart, which, again, is actually in service until 1943, granted not you know, frontline service in, in Western Europe. But then you have a new wave of aircraft that are coming through. So one of them is the Vickers Wellington. Incredible aircraft, geodetic design, which is influenced by Barnes Wallace. Uh, other raids that we're not mentioning. Uh, this is some of the other stuff he did. You so also time, have aircraft sort of like the Armstrong, really but with futuristic, isn't it? When it first comes in, it's just like yeah, be all and end all. Yeah, this this is the thing, and and you've got people saying these aircraft. And I'm, I'm going to mention the Bristol Millennium now, and uh, we, right. we, we we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail. But when an aircraft like that comes about, it's a hundred miles an hour faster. Than what the RAF is, than the RAF's fastest fighter when it first flies. Wow, that's massive. That's mind blowing, isn't it? And it lands, yeah, yeah. And when it's first delivered to stations, people are looking at it going, "This looks like it's come out of space." It, it's just complete. There are no struts. It's it's monoplane. It looks sleek. It's just the absolute peak of a modernity. And of course, it's arguably pretty much obsolete in two three years time. Yeah. Um, well, that's that another the thing. It's, it's the, the pace of change, isn't it? And pace of development means that mm. many of, the, of these aircraft that, that we have in, in 1939 are already mm. obsolete within, within a year or two, aren't they? It's the pace yeah. of change. And even, is even just aircraft like the, 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 yeah, and even aircraft like the Armstrong of Whitley, the, the, the Ferry Battle, they come in in 1937. They're absolutely found wanting pretty much in 1940. Yeah. When it comes to, to coming to war, and there's already the gears in motion. I mean, we're going to be talking about the Handy Page Halifax, I imagine. For of the... course. <laughs> good, 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 good. But they're already in motion. They're already thinking about four engine bombers and taking this to the next level in 39, 40, even beforehand. So the, the absolute, when you look at the Handy Page Hayford in service at the late 30s, they're already thinking a couple of years later about something like the Halifax which is absolutely cutting edge. And even actually, if you take it further, you've got um, Roy Chadwick, uh, A.V. Rowe, 
sketching out what is going to be the Vulcan with the Delta wing and everything in the late 1940s. It's only about 11 years, isn't it? Between the the Lancaster and the Vulcan. It's just, that just blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely blows my mind. Yeah, it's incredible. This, this is, and this is another reason why I love this topic because it's so fast paced and energetic and just so much going on. So what aircraft a bomber command is equipped with then um, when war breaks out in 1939? What are their main operational bombers at that point in time? So at this point, um, you, you've got the different groups of RAF Bomber Command, and they generally uh, operate different types of aircraft. So you've got one group, which is the Ferry Battles for the Thu uh, Blenheims. They eventually become the advanced air striking force that goes to France in uh, 1939, once Britain and France go to, uh, go to war. You've then got um, the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley, which at that point is the aircraft that can fly the furthest. It's got the best range. You've then got the Vickers Wellington. You've got the Bristol Blenheim, which is a light bomber. Um, And then you've got the Handy Page Hamden, which is a really unusual aircraft, actually. It's very, very thin with these massive wings. And when you look at the cockpit, it almost feels like a fighter aircraft because it is just. The, the pilot and this very slim fuselage and that was operated by five group who would obviously go on to to be led by arthur harris and be in, engaged in numerous raids uh not just the one that immediately probably springs to mind people i'm very fond of the hamden i must admit because it was the hamden's five group which carried out the first mine laying operations so i've got to know quite a lot about absolutely the yeah. hamden squadrons um over the, the past couple of years or so okay so We've now got a picture of what Bomber Command looks like in 1939. We've got all these aircraft. We've got starting to train all these crews coming through. But we also need air bases, don't we? I think Mm -hmm. at the end of the First World War, there was something like 300 military aerodromes. But even by 1924, there was only 27 of these left. But, of course, the problem with these, that most of them were just grass airstrips, which are completely unsuitable for heavy bomber aircraft. So I think it was in 1935 that the Air Ministry began to requisition land, if you like, and employ civilian contractors for the purposes of constructing the new bomber bases. This is an absolutely massive project, taking up literally hundreds and hundreds of square miles of land throughout particularly the east of England, East Anglia um, and Yorkshire especially. So much work is going on in this absolutely gargantuan effort. So what I wanted to do was to basically have a look at what it takes to actually construct a bomber base. So we have what's called the Class A airfields. These are the standard military installations, if you like, which were constructed by the Air Ministry Director General of Works. That's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? They set out the specification. These airfields were Air bases were all to be constructed in exactly the same way. This was the standard air base for use by heavy bombers and transports for the RAF and from 1942, of course, from the US 8th Air Force. They were basically constructed in an A shape with two long runways intersected by a shorter one. So there's the main runway for takeoff and landing and two subsidiary ones to allow for changes in prevailing wind conditions for emergency landings, that sort of thing. They are then connected by taxiways called perimeter track, which runs obviously around the outside. And along the perimeter track are the hard stands at regular intervals. These are basically concrete discs, if you like, um, where the aircraft are actually situated. Now, these have to be well spaced out and at regular Ill- intervals so that if there is an attack on the airbase from the air, fewer aircraft will be destroyed. What you don't want to do is to have them all grouped and herded up together. So typically a runway would be in this region of about 1,400 yards long, but by 1942, with the increase in engine power and bomb loads, etc., more powerful aircraft needed longer runways, and this was extended up to about 2,000 yards long. But what does it actually take to build a runway from a heavy bomber? These statistics absolutely blow my mind. 18,000 tonnes of dry cement, 90,000 tonnes of aggregate, covered in a layer of asphalt. You've got 34 miles worth of drainage systems. What? That's absolutely... 10 miles of cable ducting, 
and seven miles of wow. water mains per bomber base. And you're going to end up with around 100 bomber bases by the end of the Second World War. So the actual work required and resources required to build these sites was absolutely enormous. My fun fact of today, which I just discovered, was that rubble from buildings destroyed in the Blitz was transported yeah. daily, up to six trains a day, I think, from London to East Anglia to be used in the construction of, of these air bases. And on top of all that, you obviously have to construct all your technical buildings. So you would usually have uh, two or three hangars. You've got your workshops, your accommodation blocks, your ablutions, canteens, your mess buildings, your officers' mess, sergeants' mess, your recreational facilities, your bomb stores, etc. So you've got to bear in mind that there's going to be something in the region of about 1,500 to 2,000 people working on these bases and living there at any one time at the height of the war. And those stats just absolutely blow my mind. It's incredible. Isn't it? It's just like a mini town. It, it is, yeah. Each one was exactly like a mini town. But the amount of money that it must have taken to construct all mm -hmm. of these, as well as investing, obviously, vast amounts of money in aircraft production, it just the whole thing is just... Yeah. To blows my mind. It's not surprising we were scared after the war. Is and, it? and also, it, it, it's, it's the fact that with these runways and such like, they're going to be extended as bigger bombers that need a, a longer runway come into things. And as you said, at the start of the war, it was grass airfields. And one of the things I found fascinating, because I'm a nerd and hopefully fellow nerds are listening, I imagine they are, was watching Target for Tonight and seeing the Wellingtons take off from grass airfields when I first watched it years back. It hadn't occurred to me that they would be those grass airfields, that it would be so basic like that. I was seeing that the, the massive concrete runways, I was seeing, I don't know, Scampton or Coningsby and such like. I was like, no, actually, yeah, at the start of the war, it was very much like that. that uh, and that came later, that development and, and that, that building. And we're just talking about Bomber Command here. We're not talking as well about the USAAF. Yeah. When they come in with the bombing, we're not talking about fighter command, coastal command, etc. Plus everything else that's going on in the war. Yeah, this is huge on its own, isn't it? Let alone when you think about the scale of everything else going on. This is one of the things which always gets me about the Second World War is that the amount of effort and the amount of money, and just how do people even? Think of all of these things and plan everything to sort of run simultaneously. And it's just mind-blowing, isn't it? It is. It really, really is. It's incredible. Okay, now we're going to look at this episode's featured aircraft. And as we've touched upon earlier, this is James's favourite aircraft, the Bristol Blenheim. Off you go, James. Do your thing. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll start with a bit of a story, actually. So yesterday... Uh, I was giving, well, I was, I was part of a panel talking about Masters of the Air. So I was talking about the series and the memory of the bombing war and such like. I decided to wear a Bristol Blenheim t-shirt just Good so people knew that I was me. Absolutely, yeah. And I had three people come up to me and go, that's a Bristol Blenheim, isn't it? And one person went, that's a bit of a fashion statement, a Bristol Blenheim and such like. And I went, oh, you know, I'm just... Trends are t-shirts. I like my. Well, you, you never know. We're going to see people now, aren't we? Walking down the street with their Bristol blended t-shirts. I really doubt that. Anyway, um, and yeah, it sparked a conversation uh, of interest with the Bristol Blenheim, and there was a mixed response. Some were like, "Ah, oh, absolutely obsolete from the set off." Others saying, "Oh, it's misunderstood." Yeah, it was arguably one of Britain's main front bombers which i think it was up until 1942 41 42 it, it's forgotten about it's all about lancaster i mean that's probably a post uh, uh, sorry a pod on its own talking about it's all about the lancaster which it really really is the lancasterification of aviation history i call it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah we've got to do that we've got to talk about yeah. that yeah my interest with the Bristol Blenheim, so when it came to Bomber Command, I watched the Dan Busters film and the Lancaster, I've, I've still got a lot of time for it. It's an incredible aircraft. But when it came to my MA, I was looking at RF Bomber Command in the Battle of Britain. So I was looking at Armstrong with, with Whitley's, Wellington's and Hamden's, etc. For some reason, the Bristol Blenheim, I don't know, it, it just grabbed me. I think one of the things was when it came to the switch to, to bombing at night in December 1939, 
there is this narrative of like, oh, Bomber Command, yes, Bomb by Night from that period onwards. Don't get me started on that. That is a rant on its own because that is not the case at all. Two group didn't. They were put aside. They were used as the, the hit and run group, really. And when I was reading about them in the Battle of Britain attacking airfields later on with the Battle of the Barges, so bombing the invasion barges that were building up in the channel ports and such like, I w- wanted to know more. And y- you've got these stories of squadrons that take off and are absolutely destroyed, but they they went anyway. They knew the odds. And then when I found out about 1941, when they were, you had the you know the, the rhubarb circus raids and all the rest of it, Blenheims were frequently involved with with, with these um, attacks into France to try and draw up the Luftwaffe, which were a disaster. And then I, I looked widely at the Blenheim and the fact that it was used by the Finnish Air Force, and they love a Blenheim. They really, really love their Blenheims over there, and they put skins oh, I've seen on some it pictures of those. Yeah, didn't they put swastikas oh, on yeah. them as well? Yeah, that's another story. Yeah, yeah, that that. That was, yeah, that's another story. And yeah, they, they were used in Greece, which is another campaign that we don't really talk about, 4041. In the desert, they're used. And I think that that's where there's this development of the, the sense of tactical air force. So this is the air force that supports the army, you know, attacking troop columns and, and helping with the advance of troops and, and such like. And I think it's on the right track because everyone goes nuts about the mosquito and quite rightly it's an incredible aircraft and used brilliantly but i think that the blenheim sets a precedent for this twin engined fast multi-purpose aircraft because it is it's a first aircraft that shoots down um, a bomber at night using radar there are so many firsts to it i just think that it runs away it leads towards aircraft like the bow fighter which is incredibly useful especially against shipping and such a bow fighter. Like. Yeah. the bow fort Oh, the Beaufort, uh, Beaufighter, yeah, absolute beast. That's the only way I can describe it, it's a beast. <laughs> I go to, I, I saw the one at the RF Museum in Hendon recently, and you just look at it and just go, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's just, wow, this, this absolute machine. Um, and yeah, the, the, that's where that came from. But, but as I said earlier, it was 100 miles an hour faster than the RS fighter, and it was a, it was a private design and, and, and funded aircraft as a, as a passenger aircraft. The RAF jumped on it and went, yeah, we want that. It looks so striking and as well, isn't many... it? It just doesn't look like anything else. It's it's just such a fabulous that, that's design. That's the other I thing. I think it's beautifully designed. It the, the thing that I always say is it screams of 1930s modernity. There's something art deco about there it. There is very much there, so, there's yeah. streamlineness of it. Yeah, and I just think it's a beautiful, beautiful aircraft. I'd love to have a ride in one. Um, it's it's really just, flying. doesn't it look great? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's one at Duxford. Yeah. How is that? It's oh. a short nose blend in my I've, so um, I've, yeah. I've got I've got a soft uh, spot for the uh, Mark IV. But I should say actually it's it's a it's a bullet break. It's 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 not strictly a blend in, which was a, a Canadian built blend in. Get your full nerd on there, James, yeah. I get my full nerd on here, <laughs> aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So when does the, the Blenheim begin to be phased out and, and what's replacing it? Really, yeah. It, it's the Mosquito, it's the Beaufort, it's the Beaufighter. It's still there really until 42, 43. It, it's used in the Far East, for example. Yeah, it's. I think, it, as I say, it definitely sets a blueprint for this type of aircraft during the Second World War. And I, 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 I'm not saying it's a brilliant aircraft, it's a groundbreaking aircraft, it's not, but don't totally dismiss it. That, that's my argument. It but it was groundbreaking at the time, certainly, in terms of what it was required it was to do and yeah. what it actually achieved. Yeah. 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 Very useful. Fantastic. Thank you very much, James. So next week, I think we might have a look at the handy page, Halifax, shall we? <laughs> you know, I yeah. love it. You know, I love it. Okay, so in a regular so feature, there. there is an irregular feature of the show. We're going to be answering listeners' questions, and we would love you to send these in via X, Twitter, or an Instagram. You can find us at RAF Bomber underscore Pod on X, and at never mind the Dam Busters on Instagram. So our very first question, drum roll, comes from Brad Holloway. I love this question; it's a great one. Brad asks. Did air crew do practice parachute jumps like airborne troops did in the event of having to bail out 
or was it just a theory lesson? And we've been having some sort of discussion no. about this in the background, haven't we? Yeah. We have. Yeah, yeah. It's especially at the start of the work, it's kind of like, here's a parachute, use it if you must, jump out, pull this. That's it. <laughs> Um, but then again, and, and what else do you actually need of... to know? Well, yeah, yeah. And uh, the, the thing is, you, you've got accounts of, of people saying, oh, yeah, the first time I jumped was after I was shot down by Mission Smith 109 and I happened to pull the cord and there it was. It was there was no practice. And I, I think you raised the point earlier, Jane, that I agree with is it's a massive take up of resources, isn't it? Especially yeah. at the start of the war. Yeah. You can't be spending sort of thousands of, of pounds diverting thousands of people through a training system using up aircraft to train people to do something which essentially they're only ever going to be doing once aren't they realistically if mm-hmm. they do even if they do manage to bail yeah. out very good chance you're going to be bailing out over enemy territory you're going to be a prisoner of war and that's it your war is over mm-hmm. so why would you spend thousands and thousands um- of pounds in you know complicated airborne training basically for for, for bomber crews mm. but that's just me being cynical well yeah there's, there's also an attitude actually to parachutes that a lot of people don't really appreciate or it's, it's certainly something that you don't think of in the first world war there, there weren't parachutes um that, that was a policy that was that was taken but when parachutes were introduced in the interwar periods they were seen a little bit as an insult hang on a minute i'm going to jump out the aircraft no i i can fly this there was a little bit of pride of kind of like no no if it's damaged i'm going to try and fly this thing and a lot of people were scared of jumping as well a well lot i would people be were, to be honest i should say scared yeah. but i would mm-hmm. be I, I i you know a lot of people like, i'd rather take the controls and try and land the aircraft than jump into the abyss and have this blanket over the top of me that's going to hopefully save me i think one of those sense, people going down actually. in flames of a burning aircraft definitely there's nothing on this yeah. earth would compel yeah. me to jump out of an aircraft on fire or nope, not nope. and yeah. also well yeah that, that, that's the other thing is you haven't got a lot of time to jump out and when it comes to an aircraft i mean we've all stood up on a bus while it's moving and it's it's turning around the corner or something and you have to gra- grab hold of the handle and you just kind of sway to the side well imagine being in an aircraft that's flipping all over the place and the centrifugal force the sense of gravity that is pushing you all over it's not easy jumping out of a bomber that was portrayed really really, really well in uh, masters of the air wasn't it in the bit where where rosie has to bail yeah. out yeah that that was portrayed brilliantly i thought yeah yeah that was really good um, yeah. and that's that's another consideration and even when you're in the air and you're uh, thousands of feet, it doesn't take long to hit the ground. No. It re- really, really doesn't. So to get out of an aircraft is not easy. Mm. And that's another thing I think we can forget is, oh, do, I, I, I don't know what we think about even fighter pilots. You think, oh, you just open up the hood and, and turn the aircraft upside down, jump out. Okay, yeah, if you're lucky, that's the case. But equally, you could be, and there are accounts of people that are, tied to their seat they cannot move the gravity is so much they can't jump out God, that's I mean, terrifying I can't imagine isn't it? that i can't begin to imagine that, that and you're seeing terrifying. the ground come towards you and, and, and obviously your, your blood in your body is all over the place you're at the risk of blacking out because you know it, it, it's running out of your your brain and and drain it's just wow i just can't imagine that at all yeah not fun at all Right, our next question um, comes from Rob Warren. And Rob says, I'm trying to understand the difference between air tests and night flying tests. Any ideas? So if you have ever read um, a Bomber Command logbook from any of the air crew, you will see in their sort of daily training sessions as reference to air tests and night flying tests all the time. Can you just expand on what those, those were, James? Yeah, so really an air test is... Well, basically testing the mechanics of the aircraft. You're looking to make sure the electronics work, the oxygen's working, that the flaps are working, the wheels are going up and down and such like. When it comes to night flying tests, it's really a similar sort of thing, but at night. And it's also looking at the considerations of navigation. and So it's testing the crew as well as the aircraft. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And it is difficult and there is there there is massive skill to this and one of the things actually i'm not sure this is digressing or not but if people have watched the film journey together with 
Richard Attenborough. The whole story, and it is heavily influenced by propaganda. It's 1945. He's looking for recruits. But Richard Attenborough is this character that, and he did, he was in the RAF, by the way, folks, during the war. Volunteers. He wants to be a pilot. Desperate to be a pilot. I could totally feel that when I was 10 years old. I wanted to be nothing else than a Spitfire pilot. And I was very disappointed when I found out that the RAF didn't still have them. And he basically tries he fails as a pilot his friend does played by jack watling he becomes a pilot but then there's this scene where they're navigating at night spoiler folks and as a navigator he essentially saves the day and gets this avro anson trainer aircraft back on the ground and the message is actually the pilot is sort of is is obviously flying the plane but he is nothing without people like the navigator the wireless operator etc etc giving this guidance and the message is it's about teamwork there is no glory here it's about functionality you know every one of those roles on board a bomber aircraft was absolutely crucial to the functioning of the aircraft yep. wasn't it yeah absolutely crucial absolutely one of the things which i picked up on with regard to this idea of night flying training was that when i was researching my uncle's war service and looking at his logbook he and his crew, when they were training, getting their Halifax training, basically their, their heavy, heavy bomber training, they completed a grand total of 13 hours night flying training before being sent on to their operational mm. squadron. 13 hours, that's nothing. That's what, two trips, if that? That's just mm. horrifying, isn't it? Absolutely horrifying. It really, really is. That, that's the thing. The other thing that we kind of forget is is the amount of, tra- uh, of training and prep that goes into this and, and the losses that happen inevitably. People oh, that got yeah. lost at night or people that, were, you know, the undercarriage didn't come down or whatever. The fatality rate w- w- was there. It was real. In fact, I had a conversation recently with somebody saying that um, people forget that there were still accidents. You think, oh, so-and-so was shot down by a message net. It's like, no, they crashed because they got lost, they got lost and flew into a hill or they, the, the instruments weren't working and they thought they were X amount of feet high and no, actually, they crashed into that hill because of... Or, or we don't know, or they literally just went missing on a training exercise. Their radio equipment didn't work, or whatever. I think so it's, it's like not just going 000, over Berlin and getting it? shot down. Yeah, there's yeah. A, I think it's yeah. over eight thousand aircrew were lost in training. Yeah, which is a huge yeah. number of people, and that speaks for itself. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so I think we will wrap things up there because we've talked about so much already, and there's so much more to talk about. Do you want to wrap things up, James? Yeah, so basically, yeah, thank you so much for joining us for our inaugural podcast. We hope we've whetted your appetites for future episodes. Bomber Command, as we discussed, it's really such an enormous subject, the potential for debate and discussion. I mean, I think it's endless. What we have coming up in the next week, can you, can you enlighten us, Jane? Yep, certainly. In episode two, we're going to be joined by the wonderful and very cool Dr. Dan Ellen. I love Dan, he's great. From the University of Lincoln and the International Bomber Command Centre. And Dan is going to be telling us about the unsung heroes of Bomber Command, the ground crews. Absolutely essential to the functioning of a bomber base and the bombing campaign. We're also going to be talking a little bit about aircrew superstitions and the subject of gremlins. Really looking forward to that can't wait oh, i really can't wait dan as you say dan is absolutely brilliant ground crew so important gremlins oh my goodness we're, we're gonna go down so many rabbit holes with this i feel again. But, yeah basically um absolutely again yeah um a massive thank you from us for listening for for, for for downloading this please do subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts and we'll see you next time yeah thanks guys see you again soon bye